Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Lurie. I'm here with Professor Muhammad Islam, and we're here today to talk a little bit about intellectual property. Uh, what it is, some details about some types of intellectual property. This is a very high level overview. Intellectual property has, has become a big business lately, and uh, yeah, Professor Islam is, is an entrepreneur, as he'll tell you in a minute, and uh, he's got some interesting perspectives on it. Well, you think about the fact that Google bought Motorola Mobility for something like $12 billion for its patents. You look at uh, Nortel got bought basically for $4 billion for its intellectual property. Um, you look at Apple having won a lawsuit against Samsung for basically a block of glass for $1.2 billion judgment. So patents are getting people's interest and they are a valuable asset of the company. And so we're here to tell you a little bit about more broadly than just patents. Patent is one category of intellectual property. Just a little more about who we are. Um, again, I'm Tom Lurie. Uh, I've been practicing intellectual property law for 30 plus years now. Um, I went to U of M undergrad, got an engineering degree in computer engineering, and then I uh, got a law degree from U of M also in 1982. Um, I'm a registered patent attorney, which is a separate process that you can go through. So in addition to being an attorney, you can also be a registered patent attorney. And as Professor Ism will tell you, you don't even have to be a, an attorney to be a patent agent. So I'm Mohammed Islam. I'm a full professor here in the College of Engineering, uh, both in electrical and computer engineering, as well as in biomedical engineering. And I also have a joint appointment at the uh, School of Medicine in internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine. Um, I am a registered patent agent. Patent agent is someone who can write patents, who can do all the prosecution patents, but we can't do trademarks and we can't go to court. Uh, representing court. Uh, I also teach a course entitled Patent Fundamentals, which is taught here. It's sort of a 400 level course, so it's a sen generally senior level, first year grad students kind of level of course. Um, the students actually write patents by the end of the semester as their final project. We take them all the way through the process of writing patents. I'm also an inventor. I've got over 130 patents or patents pending. Uh, these days I write most of my patents myself. Um, and I've spun out six companies from the University of Michigan, and every one of those companies have been, the basis of those companies have been patents uh, that I've written. Um, so, again, for me, patents are a starting point for high-tech uh, companies. There are three basic kinds of intellectual property that we're going to talk about today. Uh, trademarks is one kind, copyrights, and then patents are the three kinds we're going to talk about today. In addition, there are some other things that fall into the category of intellectual property. Uh, trade secrets, for example, we're not going to have time to talk about that today, but, but as it sounds, it's a secret that you keep uh, as part of your business. Um, and there are other things that relate to intellectual property. But the core of intellectual property is, are these three items, trademarks, copyrights, and patents. And the way we're going to talk about these in this webinar is to envision a new business starting up and to talk about the kinds of intellectual property issues that might arise as you start a new business. So, um, the next slide just sort of gives you an overview of the various types of intellectual property, uh, what does it protect, how long does it last, and the test for infringement, all of which we'll cover in the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes. So let's say that you want to start a new business, and you might wonder why do I care about these various things. So again, just using that as sort of a framework. So let's say I, I'm going to start a new business. I put together a business plan. I seek funding. I decide on whether it's going to be an LLC, uh, S Corp, C Corp, partnership. And then I choose a name for my business. So is there something I need to worry about in a name, Tom, for example? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this, this is where trademark rights come into play. Uh, trademarks and service marks, which is the service version of a trademark, uh, are the kinds of things that you use to protect names of your products, uh, slogans that you might use together with your business or your products, and so the, the trademark rights are the first kind of intellectual property that we're going to talk about today. So what is a trademark? A trademark is any word or symbol or device that is used to identify your goods or your services to distinguish them from the goods or services that other people provide. 
Um, and some examples that I've got here, the Gap for uh, clothing and McDonald's for fast food, for example, or Kodak for, well, I don't know what they do today, um, but for certainly for uh, camera equipment in the old days and film and things like that. Trademarks are interesting because they're slightly different from other forms of intellectual property. Most forms of intellectual property, copyrights, patents, trade secrets, are things you own, things that, that you own as a business. A trademark is really more the public's right to be free from confusion. And what a trademark does is it pre prevents the public from being confused about where a particular product or a particular service is coming from. And so that's why trademarks are a little different than, than regular types of intellectual property. Um, now, we've talked about words that can be trademarks, but other things can be trademarks as well. Color, for example, can be a trademark. Um, the first item on, on my uh, screen here is the, the vertical bars of color. And a lot of you will recognize that as uh, the Lifesavers trademark. That is an actual trademark of, of Lifesavers, those vertical bars, just like that. And so if somebody else tries to sell a, a flavored candy with vertical bars, that would be trademark infringement. Um, the red and white colors uh, there, I think a lot of people will recognize. That's the Campbell soup can. And again, those colors by themselves, without any words, without anything else, are trademarked for Campbell soup. And the last item here that, that shows color as a trademark is the tractor. All you, all you can tell is there's a tractor and it's colored green. And again, most people would look at that and say, oh, that must be a John Deere tractor because John Deere, their color, trademark color, is that color green. So that's one kind of trademark you can have. That's something you don't think about a lot. Uh, sounds are another form of trademark that exists. Uh, we're going to see if we can play this so everybody can hear it. We'll, we'll find out here. So everybody recognize that as the NBC sound. Again, that's, that's trademarked and registered trademark for NBC. Second one. Oh, I talked over it. Try again. There we go. Everybody should say Green Giant at the end of that. And again, that's, that's a registered trademark for, uh, for the Green Giant Company. So why are trademarks important for your business? Um, again, as I mentioned, they signify the source of your goods or your services. And so when somebody sees your trademark, if it's a trademark that's well established, they'll recognize that mark and say, oh, that's from so-and-so company. And, and assuming you have a good reputation, and hopefully you do, um, they'll want to buy your goods versus some other competitors' goods. Um, it protects the reputation and goodwill of your company. If somebody's using your trademark, then that can damage your reputation or damage the goodwill that you've built up in your company. And so that's why you try to prevent people from using your trademarks. And then the most important thing about trademarks to know is the trademark rights are created by actually using the trademark. Okay. You don't get a trademark by just filing a piece of paper in the trademark office. Um, I think we have a question. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, you, you, you get a trademark by actually using it on your product or using it in your, in your service. And then by that use, you establish the rights. In other words, people become, so, people associate your goods or your services with your company, and that's how you create a trademark. So uh, before I go to the question, let me ask a question. So we're often used to people having uh, R, or um, some other letter with yeah. a circle around it. W what does that mean? Well, the, the circle R means specifically that you have a federal trademark registration. And the only time you can use the circle R is if you have a federal trademark registration. Something you apply for, it's not a requirement to have a federal trademark registration, but it's something you can get. The TM is, can be used by anybody to indicate that I claim this is my trademark. We have a question from Scott Lang. In the case of the soup can, I understand that the red and white color scheme is their trademark, but isn't there a threshold where simply a color over top of another becomes too basic of an idea or concept? Couldn't many different marks incorporate similar scheme, uh, just not on a can or in that format or aspect ratio? Well, that's true. Color can be a diffic difficult trademark to get. In order to get color as your trademark, you have to show that 
a lot of people associate that color with your particular goods or services. In this case, the Campbell's soup can is, is goods. And so Campbell's soup couldn't, on day one, put a can with red and white on it on the store shelves and, and say, now I've got a trademark, I can, I can register that trademark. They actually had to, to show the trademark office that people actually do associate their color with their soup cans. And once you can do that, pink for fiberglass insulation is another example. Enough people recognize that if you have pink fiberglass, you've got Owens, Owens Corden fiberglass, that that becomes a trademark for that company. So you can build up that recognition over time. Um, so you can't get it immediately, but you can by proper marketing uh, and proper advertising and use of the trademark, create trademark rights in the color. Same thing with sound, by the way. We talked about this a little bit already. How do you protect the <coughs> trademark? Um, at the basic, most basic level, trademark rights exist by using the trademark. So nothing is necessary to actually get a trademark and protect it. On the other hand, you can get additional advantages and additional protections by filing registrations for your trademark. So you can either register at the state level, or you can register at the federal level, or you can do both. And by doing some federal registration, you get <coughs> things like nationwide rights. So even though you may have only used your trademark in the Midwest, for example, with a federal registration, your trademark would be good all through the United States. Um, otherwise, you'd have to actually use your trademark in every place that you want to, want to protect it. You have access to federal courts and other things. So there are some advantages to getting registrations. And so if you're thinking about trademarks and trademark rights, you should talk to somebody about whether a federal registration or even a state registration would be a good idea for your particular trademark. Trademarks last as long as you continue to use them. So your trademark rights can last almost forever. Um, and, and there are obviously a lot of trademarks that have been around a long, long time. Think about the car companies, their trademarks have been around for many, many years. Um, if you have a federal registration, you have to renew your registration every 10 years. So the federal government knows that you actually can have continued using it. But all you have to do is show that you've used it and then they will renew your trademark right. But if you haven't registered, again, just use is, an, is enough and as long as you continue to use it, you have trademark rights. And then the last topic we have on, on trademarks is how do you know if somebody is, is infringing your trademark? How do you know if they're misusing your trademark? Well, again, if we go back to the beginning, uh, the, the concept of trademark is to prevent likelihood of confusion. So if, if people are being confused <coughs> because somebody else is using something similar to your mark, then that would be trademark infringement. That's the test. There's a likelihood of confusion. Um, and so the test looks at what a normal buyer of your product or your service would, would think if they see a competing trademark. And if they would think that they, that particular good, you know, they see a, a sh on the shelf they see a soup can with red and white on it, maybe the colors are inverted, but it's still got the same red and white colors. If somebody would be confused by that, then that's trademark infringement. And some examples I've got here of confusing marks, word marks in this case, uh, somebody tried to use salad whip uh, on their, their whipped uh, salad dressing, and that was found to be confusing with Miracle Whip. Uh, the same thing with Fundo for some, some kids' uh, clay, I guess, uh, that was found to be confusing with Play-Doh. So you can see the words that are very similar, even though the exact same words um, can be confusing. We have a quick question from oops, uh, Nancy. And the question is, will we be discussing patents later on and should you hold us questions? We will be, if you recall, we were talking about trademarks, then copyrights, and then patents. So it'll be the third segment. Um, so if you don't mind, hold the question until then. So let me um, ask, so again, if I'm doing a startup, so uh, whatever name I decide for that company, I can trademark that. And if I have a logo, I might trademark that. That's right. That's right, Any anything that would differentiate you from your competitors. Now it's very important if you're going to come up with a new logo or a new name to make sure that it's not too similar to one that already exists. And for that purpose you can do your own searching um, and of course you can get uh, experts to help you do this too. Uh, if you go to a local uh, intellectual property lawyer they can um, help you search for and decide whether your 
the mark you want to use or the name you want to use is too similar to something that already exists. And that's an important thing to do because the last thing you want to do is start a new company, have it be somewhat successful, and then find out you're infringing on somebody's trademark and have to change your name. That's never good to do. Uh, again, I'm in my company. I've come up with a name. I've come up with a logo. And, and so I may have trademarked those, and I may have even registered. So I may either TM it or put an R with a circle around it if I have a federal registration. Um, but now, I, before I go to sell things, I need to prepare my marketing materials. Uh, these might include websites, brochures, white papers, videos, press room. What do I do with those? All right, well, now we're talking <coughs> about copyrights. What is a copyright? A copyright is an original work of authorship that's fixed in some tangible way, in something that can be reproduced. The two basic requirements are that it has to be original, so you have, to, you have to have created it yourself. You can't copy it from somebody else. And you have to put it in some tangible form. So paper, electrons is tangible as far as the copyright world is concerned. But if you're just out on the street corner talking to people walking by, that's not tangible. Basically anything that you can create is copyrightable. Literary, literary works, musical works, dramatic works like plays and the music that accompanies them. Um, graphics, motion pictures, sound recordings, architectural works, all those things can be copyrighted. Some famous copyrights, um, the Disney movies and their characters are all copyrighted, not, not surprisingly. Um, the Happy Birthday song is copyrighted, most people know that, but most people don't know it's just the words, not the, not the music. So if you sing different words to the music, you're okay. An interesting thing about the, the copyright for this was it was supposed to expire back in 1991, uh, but Congress has extended the copyright uh, protection twice now, and so now the, the copyright for the song expires in 2030. So you've got a few more years, a few more birthdays to go through before you can sing the song without paying copyright royalties. Um, there is fair use, and, and we can get talk about that. But, um, and then Warhol paintings, and my, there's our Campbell soup can again. Um, those are copyrighted. So if copyright law protects anything that's original, that's in tangible form, what isn't protected by copyright? Certainly the underlying ideas. So if you come up with a storyline and an idea for a story, um, the words that describe your story are copyrighted, but the idea itself is not. Um, so looks like we have another question. Uh uh, I've got a question from Nancy. What if you find a digital picture on the web, perhaps printed in a news editorial, and there is no attribution? How do you go about finding who owns the copyright? Well, uh, the starting point is if, if you have the website, or if the news organization in particular, you can contact them to find out. You might be able to do it using Google, Google search. Um, if you have, uh, you can Google often can come up with similar um, pictures and, and maybe that'll give you the attribution. Um, it's, it's not necessarily easy to figure that out, especially today with lots of pictures on the, on the web. Um, as I'm going to mention in a minute, copyrights exist from the moment of creation. So when you take a picture, when you write something down, you have a copyrighted work. And unless you give up your copyright, expressly give up your copyright, that copyright exists in that, in that copyrighted picture or, or words or whatever. So if you write a blog or you take a picture and upload it to a, a web site that shares pictures, you have a copyright in whatever you've done, um, which means that if somebody copies your picture, they've infringed your copyright. Finding you would be pretty, pretty tough, perhaps, depending on how many times that picture has been uh, used in, in various places. So I'm, it's not necessarily easy to find the source of a picture, but it is the kind of thing, if you're going to use something commercially especially, or in your business, you do want to find out if, if whatever you're using is, has already been copyrighted, and if so, get permission to use it. Um, there are things such as fair use, and the pictures and images that I've used in this presentation will be considered fair use. It's for educational purposes, it's non-commercial, so even though the things that I'm using may be copyrighted, there is an exception where you can use them under certain circumstances without having to, to pay royalties. Let me ask a question. Um, so all my students, when they write their thesis, like to, on the first page, put a C with a circle around it and yep. type their name in the year. <laughs> Are they copyrighted? Absolutely. 
as soon as you create it, it's copyrighted. And you can put the circle C on it, you can put the year, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, you don't have to register your copyright, and we'll get to that in a second too, but, but you may, where there is a registration process, and just like trademarks, it gives you additional rights, um, but it's certainly not a requirement. You so have it what, from the moment that, of creation. What does that student um, do when he puts that C and the name and the date? It's just giving notice to everybody that they claim copyright, but you don't even have to have that. You don't need the circle C, you don't need your name, you don't need the date. It is copyrighted. And those other things are just there to, as a warning more than anything. Um, same thing with your pictures. You could put a circle C on your pictures, you could put watermarks in your pictures, you could do other things. You don't have to. Um, they're copyrighted immediately. Now I will say that a lot of these services have agreements when you sign up for the service that you agree that whatever pictures you upload to the service are not are free for them to copy. So even though you may have a copyright, you also have the ability to give up your copyrights. And a lot of these picture uploading services, they make you agree ahead of time that you're going to give up your rights and that they can use them and copy them and, and so forth. So take a look for that. They'll be in their terms of service if you want to find out where that is. Again, registration is not required, but it may be beneficial. Um, you can get statutory damages, which are money that um, normally you have to prove you've actually been harmed to get damages, money for copyright infringement, but if you have a registered copyright, you can get the, what the, is called statutory damages, a minimum amount, no matter how much you've been harmed. We have a question from Scott on the previous question I raised. <clears throat> In some cases, though, aren't academic works and theses uh, also the intellectual property of the university? Well, again, there can be agreements that uh, exist whereby if you create something either as an employee of a company or employee of a university, then you've given the university or the, your company the right to use your copyright, or maybe even they, they have the agreement says you're assigning your copyrights. At the moment you create it, you're the owner. But there may be other agreements and other things in place that require you to assign or automatically assign rights or give licenses. And so depending on the circumstances, your copyright may be licensed to somebody. Uh, how long does the copyright last? Well, um, for an individual, it's life plus 70 years. Um, if you're a joint owner, it's the last surviving author plus 70 years. And then if it's a work made for hire, such as a company, you've been hired by somebody to create something, and therefore a company owns the copyright as opposed to you as the individual author, then it's the shorter of 95 years from publication or 120 years from, from creation. Again, these dates used to be 50 years, life plus 50 years, for example, and, and Congress has extended these. And that's thanks to our friends at Disney and other companies <laughs> right. who want Mickey Mouse to be. That's right. They don't want to give up the copyrights <laughs> to those early Disney movies. Absolutely. Um, and then how, how do you know if your copyright's been infringed? Well, copyright is, is actually, the name says it all. It's the right to keep others from copying or the right to control copying. So if somebody has copied your work, they've infringed your copyright. Um, and there's two ways to show copyright infringement. You have to show they had access to your work. In other words, they were able to, to get it somewhere on the web or somewhere. And that their work, what they've created with it, is substantially similar. Now, Obviously, if all they've done is made a copy of it, an exact copy, then it's substantially similar. But sometimes what you find is they've seen your, your work and then they revise it in some way. And so the, the difficulty often is, is it substantially similar to the original? If it's changed enough, then it's no longer a copy. And that's always a tough question, and, and judges and juries have to resolve those kinds of questions. So if you walk over to a copying machine um, and you make a copy of an article, let's say, are you violating copyright law? Yes, unless it's fair use. And what's fair use is sort of flexible. It's, it's not... A specific, there's no specific definition of fair use, but if you're using it for a one-off purpose, for educational purposes, for nonprofit purposes, that's generally considered fair use. There can be other kinds of fair use too, but, uh, but if, on the other hand, if you're going to use it commercially, you're going to sell a lot of copies of it or make a lot of copies of it, even if you're not selling them, then that probably is not fair use. So, for example, uh, if you're using a DVR to copy a show, that's 
falls within the fair use? It does fall within the fair use. In fact, that went up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, if all you're doing is time shifting a show, then that's perfectly fine. You're allowed to capture the show. This was in the days of uh, videotape, by the way. This was on the Betamax uh, videotape system. But if you capture a show just to watch later, that's perfectly fine. On the other hand, if you take that show and burn it onto a DVD or multiple DVDs and start giving it away to all your friends, that's not fair use anymore. We have a question um, from Nancy. What if you make a copy of a digital picture to auction for charity? Is that fair use? If, if you're taking somebody else's digital picture that they have a copyright in and you're off, auctioning that digital picture off, then that would not be fair use. Um, it may be for charity, but you're taking away that author's ability, or in this case probably a photographer, their ability to control the copying of that picture. And again, copyright is the ability to control the copies. And so if you're doing something more than, if you're just displaying it as a background at the charity, that's probably fair use. But if you're actually auctioning it off, almost certainly it's not. So let's move to the third uh, leg of what we're going to talk about, and that's uh, invention. So now I'm a startup company, let's say. And um, the reason, especially high-tech companies, uh, especially hardware companies, would file patents or have inventions is um, to bring in investors. Uh, they're going to want to be able to show to the investors that they have enough runway to be able to make this product and get it out into the marketplace. Uh, or if once they get in the marketplace, others aren't going to sweep in and take over the market once you prove that there's a market. So you want to have some sort of protection and a, a, what's often called a barrier to entry. And that um, right to exclude or that monopoly that the government grants you is what's called a patent. And so uh, what do we look at if we want to try to get a patent? Well, there are several things. First of all, there are different types of patents. And so you need to decide what kind of patent are you going to get. The most common kind of patent, the patent most people think about when they hear the name patent, is what's called a utility patent. And a utility patent protects products, processes, things you make as a manufacturer. Um, and, and there are certain requirements for a utility patent. It has to be new. In other words, it's something you invented is brand new. It has to be useful, and it has to be non-obvious, meaning that if you take a look at what other people have done in the past, it can't be an obvious variation on what they've done. Um, if you've got something like that, then you can apply for a patent on a utility patent. And, and if you get a patent, then you get a patent right that, that lasts for 20 years from the date you file your patent application. And I've got some examples of some famous uh, Patents, of course, Thomas Edison and his electric lamp is, is one example. Um, his, his invention was the filament. Uh, most people know that light bulbs existed before Thomas Edison, but what he invented was a way to make the filament last a long time. So that's what his patent's on. Uh, the Wright brothers have a patent, had a patent, it's expired, of course, on their flying machine. And again, their invention wasn't the actual machine, but a way of controlling it. And so if you can see these, these dotted lines here, what the, they invented was a way of controlling the edge flaps so that you could actually control the way the, the machine moved and flew through the air. So their patent was on the way of controlling a flying machine. So just to point out, when the category is called utility patents, but in general, when someone says a patent, that's what they're usually referring to. That's there are other categories as well that Tom will go through, but again, Utility patent is the official name, but usually we just call it a patent. That's right, and that's right. When most people think of a patent, that's the kind of patent they think about. It's when an inventor comes up with a, a new widget and gets a patent on it. Another type of patent that's very useful in, in business uh, is a design patent. A design patent is different from a utility patent because it only protects the ornamental features of what you make, as opposed to the, the thing that makes it uh, useful and unique. Um, so the ornamental features, in a sense, it's much like a, a copyright uh, in the sense that it's the expression of, of, of what you've made. And copyrights and design patents can coexist. You can have a copyright and a design patent on the same thing. 
Um, but it's for an article of manufacture, so something you make, and it's got to have ornamental features. A design patent specifically does not cover the things that make the, uh, the, the item you've, you've made work. So it's not okay. the hinges. To give an example, you can have a design patent on the phone, but you can also have utility patents on what's inside and how it works. Exactly. Uh, let me ask a question. So, you know, we're used to this blue oval with the word F-O-R-D in it. Tell me what the difference between a copyright and a design patent for that. Okay. Thing. Well, that would more, actually more be a trademark um, because it's, it's a designation of the, of the origin of, of the product. So, whereas the, the oval with the, lo with the word Ford in, in the middle um, could be copyrighted, um, it's, it's more likely to be viewed as a trademark for the company. Um, where you would see, uh, let's go to, this is, these are some design patents, famous design patents. The Statue of Liberty got a design patent. Um, and there's your iPhone. That's a previous version. It's uh, probably the iPhone 3 maybe. I don't know which version this is. But again, it's, it's the ornamental features. And, and Apple could have and may well have a copyright in the same design. Um, again, they coexist because they're both ways of expressing information. The primary difference between a design patent and a copyright is copyrights can exist in lots of different things. Words, pictures, and, and actual physical products. Whereas a design patent you can only get for an actual product. You can't get a design patent for, for your movie script, for example. Um, so that's the basic difference and the type of coverage that you can get um, also differs too. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, we have a question here. So uh, just to kind of highlight sure. the importance of design paths, what Tom said, very important to understand, is that this is only for the outside appearance. It can't, you can't get a design patent on something inside. So, you know, the design patent might be for the outside of this phone and how it looks, but it can't be about the chip that's inside. It's not possible because the person can't see it. And also the dotted lines may be, in this case, cutaways or something connached, but it cannot be for something inside because if you can't see it, it can't be design patent. That's one thing important. The other thing, just to kind of remind you that, you know, I've, many people sent me email after the decision of Apple getting $1.2 billion that they said you can patent a piece of glass. How did they get 1.2 billion for that? That's a design patent. That was a design patent case, absolutely right. It was on not this particular design, it was on their iPad design. Um, but it was a drawing very similar to this. And Samsung, had, the judge found that Samsung had made a substantial copy of the Apple design for the iPad. Um, again, you, that was a design patent case and Apple was, was, good, was smart to get design patents. One of the big differences between a copyright and a design patent is for copyrights, as I said, there has to be copying involved. So somebody has to have seen what you did and made a copy of it in some way. For design patent and for patents in general, no copying is necessary. If somebody came up with the exact same design independently, never having seen Apple's product, now of course everybody knows Apple's product ubiquitous and everybody's seen it, but if, but if somebody living in a cave somewhere came up with the exact same design after Apple invented it, they would still be liable for design patent infringement because the designs are the same, even though they've never seen an Apple product. On the other hand, they would not be liable for copyright infringement because they didn't copy. So that's a fundamental difference between the two. We have a couple questions coming in, sure. so let's see if we can handle them one by one. Byron asks, technology companies go to great lengths to protect their patents. How is it possible then that modern products, e.g. tablets, MP3 players, laptop computers, are replicated by various companies so quickly? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, they may be replicated quickly. It may not be legal to replicate them. And then the question is, how do you enforce your rights? Apple and Samsung as well. Samsung's got a number of patents and is suing Apple the other way around. Um, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to enforce your, your rights in these products. Sometimes companies don't have the ability or they don't have the interest. They look at it as, well, my product's you know, been on the market for a year. I'm going to come out with my new product in six months. I don't really care if somebody's copied the old product because my new product's coming up. So there are practical reasons for why 
companies, even though they may have patents on these things, don't enforce their patents or have trouble enforcing their patents. And so in many ways, it's like almost every other agreement. You can sign an agreement. Yes, you may have it on paper, but if you're not willing to pursue it or go to court, people will continue violating. And you can break your lease and your landlord, if they choose not to take you to court, you break your lease. <laughs> and so it's an agreement and hopefully people will live by it, but if they don't, right. you really do have to enforce it. Yeah, the, gover right. the government doesn't enforce copyrights or patents. You have to enforce them yourself. And it can be fairly expensive sometimes to do that. Why don't we touch, uh, do plant patents before we take the next question? Okay. Plant patents are the third category of patents. They're not very common except for people in the, the plant world. Um, there, Farmers may disagree, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not going to be for things like corn. Now, you can get a, and Monsanto has a patent on corn, for example. And but seeds. but it, this is for ornamental plants primarily and plants that are asexually reproduced. Um, so if you create a new kind of rose plant with new colors, things like that, you may be able to get a patent on that. Asexually reproduced, by the way, means not from seed. That's Although right. it can be thereafter reproduced from seed. That's right. So here's an example of uh, a patent on a type of peach that uh, somebody got a patent on, a peach tree. And here's some red, uh, blackberry plants that somebody got a patent on. Again, they created this combination of plant by grafting together two different plants and then creating it as opposed to planting them from seeds. So. Um, let's go to a question here. Um, there's actually, I guess, a two part or more, maybe more parts. Let me just read it and then we'll summarize it. I have several utility patents on software products. I'm now producing a physical piece of art from a digital picture with unique software used internally and robotics. Uh, we are using a unique process and technology to produce highest quality, high resolution, even beyond handmade. Do I need to file provisional patents on the technology and processes before we sell one, even if we are not revealing the software, hardware, robots to anyone? Um, and the second part to that, I think, as usually you must file a provisional on software used by others before you. So if I could summarize the question, uh, they're thinking of going to market and they're asking do they need to file a provisional application first. Okay, and, and let me preface this. I should have probably said this before. <coughs> We're not giving legal advice here. This is important to know. Um, we're just he's giving, the lawyer on the team, by the yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> we're just we're just giving our, our general thoughts and general impressions. Um, so don't take this as legal advice. If you have a, a legal question, it's better to ask a lawyer because they're going to need a lot more facts than we can assimilate here and then we can talk about here. But let me say, in general, in the United States, you can make and use your invention for up to a year before you have to file a patent application. But that's not true in other countries. So if you have something that you think is important and is worth patenting, not only in the United States, but in other countries as well, it's better to file a patent application, whether a provisional or non-provisional patent application, before you first bring it to the public. Um, but in the U.S., if you're only seeking U.S. patent rights, and patent rights are territorial, they only apply to the country that's involved. So if you're seeking only a U.S. patent, then you would have up to a year to file either a provisional or a, a straight utility patent, non-provisional utility patent, after you've disclosed your invention to the public. Um, so let's, let's hit that point again, because sure. I think to the question, and also I'm sure many people are, uh, are, want to understand. So this is often referred to as the grace period. So in the United States, and it's, it's only in the United States, this is not something uh, accepted internationally, there's a one-year grace period for your own work, for if you publish or give a talk or uh, put on sale. So in the case of what Nancy's talking about, that would be an on-sale um, grace period, meaning if it goes on sale, she's still got one year before which she can um, file a patent. Again, that's only in the United States that grace period exists. Um, the what what happens on international? Do you become your own prior art, or do you block yourself from getting an international patent? Right. If you use that grace period. Yes. If 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 you use the one year grace period in the U.S. and then try to file a patent application internationally in some other country, then what will happen is your own work will be used against you to prevent you from getting a patent. So. 
it's, it's uh, the, the phrase uh, Professor Islam used was prior art. Um, it's art in the sense of state of the art, the technology. So art in this context means technology. So prior technology is what the patent office looks at to decide whether your invention is new and not obvious. And you can be your own prior art. If you wait more than the year in the United States or internationally, if you file a patent application after you've made your invention public in the United States or elsewhere, then you are prior art to your patent application. And in that case, you're barred from getting a patent in, in that instance. And the reason is that both the United States and other countries want to have you file your patent application as quickly as possible. Now, the United States gives you this one-year grace period, but nobody else does. But the whole point is this is supposed to be done promptly. You're supposed to get your patent information into the United States government as quickly as possible. And they try to turn around fairly quickly. It takes a fairly long time, nonetheless. But the idea is to get patents to the public as soon as they can be made available to the public. Um, so uh, this is important particularly for people in universities or academic more generally. So often we'll publish a paper, okay, and you know, however tech transfer office works or whatever their routine is for filing patent, they may not get to it by the time that pa paper publishes. So if you're one of the authors on that paper, you have within the United States still a one year grace period and so you can still file a U.S. patent within one year of publication date. And so that's why you'll often hear when, uh, when you're asking or you're doing a disclosure, they're asking, is this intended to be published or you know, is there a publication date? Because that publication date becomes the one year, that starts the clock of one year within which time they have to file a patent application. Um, and that's actually survived in the new laws, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, there's a follow-up question, which uh, I want to, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I, uh, I'm going to sort of say it my own way. Uh, the question is that while we're just selling the device, not necessarily how it works, and so they don't know necessarily what the software or hardware inside of it is, I think that I would answer this, and Tom, you may disagree, is it still constitutes what's called an on-sale bar. In other right. words, I may not know what's inside the phone, but if it's been on sale, once it goes on sale, there's only one year within which that grace period, even if I don't know how the iPhone works, how the, uh, the chip in there works, it's been on sale. And as long as it, the sale date starts that clock of the one year grace period, would you agree That's with true. that? That's true. Now, it may be the case, if I understand the question correctly, what you may be asking is, well, if I just use a piece of software, a unique piece of software to create something, but the software is not inside what I create, and the software itself is not being sold, is that then, does that start the one-year clock when I sell the product that was made from the software? And the answer is that's a gray area. I definitely go seek legal advice because they're going to need a lot more information than we can get in this webcast they're going to have to analyze that specific case. In some cases, the sale of the product made by the software would start the one-year clock, and in other cases, it would not. So that's the kind of thing you should get some legal advice on before you do it. So a couple of, just to understand what sets that one-year clock going, the grace period clock. So certainly a publication. Uh, you know, a, a archival journal paper, for example, or a conference paper. Now, again, those are the days that it's available to the public. So, for example, it's not the day that you submitted it for review, but it's the day that it either publishes or the conference occurs. That starts the one-year clock. If you put something on sale and it's merely an offer for sale, it doesn't have to be that you actually sold one, but if you put a newspaper ad and say, or a web ad and say this is for sale, that starts the one-year clock. If it's public uh, knowledge, for example, you give a talk or you show people how to do this in, a, in Costco or something, that starts the one-year clock. So these are the kind of events that begin that one-year clock within which time, if you exceed your one year, you have basically given up the right to patent. That's right. Um, if you're in doubt and uh, if, you file, if you can, if you have the means to file a provisional patent, you, you've sort of Number one, you may have pre um, preserved your international rights, but also number two, you're playing it safe, meaning you're not arguing whether or not you set off that clock or not. You've got a provisional patent in place. That is proof positive that you had the invention as of that date, 
and, and uh, you know, you've, you've got your first to file in that sense. And we should talk a little bit about the difference between a provisional application and a regular a application. Um, a provisional application can never become a patent by itself, but it's sort of a placeholder. You file it in the U.S. Patent Office. Um, the Patent Office doesn't do anything with it other than put it away in a file. And you have one year then from that filing date to file a regular patent application. If you don't file within that one year, then the provisional all but disappears. Nobody ever looks at it again. If you file a regular patent application within that year, then that provisional application becomes the starting point for your, for your earliest date. And so that can give you some protection then back to that earliest, that earliest filing date of your provisional application. But again, the provisional application itself never becomes a patent application. You have to file a separate patent application and then identify the provisional as, as something that you filed earlier. So as much as we love to think of Congress as they do no, nothing Congress, they actually did something. And that's actually <laughs> fairly relevant here. It's called America Invents Act. It was signed into law in September 2011 by Pre President Obama, and it came fully into effect on March 16th of this year, 2013. Um, it's fairly significant that it's the, it's probably the biggest change in patent law in over 100 years, but it's certainly the first major overall of the patent law since 1952. Um, Tom will talk more to it. Let me just, I guess, hit three key points that I think about when I think about AIA, America Invents Act. Number one, it's a first to file, as opposed to first to invent. Um, that's critical because, yes, it removes a lot of the arguments about who figured it out first or who invented first, but it also means that in many cases, especially large corporations, maybe small inventors are rushing to the patent office to file their patents because it's a first to file. Who, who got the filing date first wins. Number two, is the definition of prior art is actually vastly increased. So whereas, for example, on sale, uh, on sale bars, public use bars previously were for knowledge or sales within the United States, now it can be anywhere in the world. Um, and so that really expands dramatically. Before, when I gave a talk, if I didn't hand out a transcript or a set of my slides, it may or may not count as prior art. Now, regardless of whether I hand out a set of slides, the fact I gave the talk becomes prior art. I become my own prior art. And so number two, the definition prior art has vastly increased. And then number three, and this is if you need to go enforce your patent, i.e. litigate, whereas at least for the patents that were filed before March of 2013, you had at least case law uh, back to 1952. Now there's a lot of uncertainty. Congress writes only a very few words, but then there's a whole body of court cases that help to interpret how those words are to be uh, interpreted. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're, you know, you just, you're going to have to see, we'll have to see how it goes. And so it's a pretty dramatic change in the patent laws. Yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting uh, few years. The first applications under the new AIA were filed uh, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day? No, March 18th, I guess. That was, that was a Sunday. Yeah, that was Sunday. <laughs> March 18th of uh, 2013. And those patent applications almost certainly won't issue for another couple of years. Um, in general, it takes the patent office about two years on average to take a patent application from the beginning to the end of the process. And so, He's optimist. It's closer to three. <laughs> and sometimes it's longer, especially with longer. sequestration, I guess. Um, but in any event, it's going to be a few years before we see these patents issue under the new law. Um, so at least <coughs> until the year 2032, there are really going to be two sets of patent laws. One set of patent laws under the 1952 Act, which applies to all the patent applications that were filed before March 16th of 2013. And then all the patents that issue after, for applications file filed after. after March 16th, the new law applies. And so you're going to have to, if, if you're trying to understand whether you might infringe somebody else's patent, one of the first things you're going to have to figure out is, is this patent a patent from the old law or a patent from the new law? For the first few years, that's going to be easy because all the patents are going to be under the old law. But starting in two to three years, that's going to be an open question. Um, so that's, that's going to be interesting. Um, and then as Professor Islam said, 
how is this new disclosure concept going to be interpreted by the courts? Because under the old law, it was pretty clear for the most part when you'd made a disclosure that started the one year clock running and when you hadn't made a disclosure that starts the one year clock. Under the new law, all it says is disclosure. So is that how public does the disclosure have to be? If you go to, uh, you know, if you go to your friend's house and you tell your friend about it, is that enough of a public disclosure to start the one-year clock? Nobody knows yet. The courts haven't decided that question. If you go in a classroom and you teach in a classroom, is that enough? Well, probably, but again, maybe not. Maybe, maybe if the classroom's closed and, and the students have all agreed to keep what you say quiet and never tell anybody, maybe it doesn't start the one-year clock. These are open questions that have to be resolved. The process of filing the patent application, fortunately, stays pretty much the same. So if you're looking to get a patent, the process doesn't change, but the results that you get are going to be different under the new law and the old law. So two things that I think are um, important. Number one is, I think we'll get to, by the way, I'm sorry if I go ahead, is uh, number one, the one year uh, grace period that we talked about actually remains. In that sense, it's still different than the rest of the world. Right. But like the rest of the world, or when, it, when Tom talks about harmonizing with, with the rest of the world, we will be a first to file, like, which is what system right. most of the world does. Yeah, it's actually literally first inventor to file because you still have to be an inventor. You can't copy somebody else's invention and get a patent on it. Um, you still have to be the inventor. Uh, but, but it's accurate that whoever gets to the patent office first, for the most part, there are exceptions to every rule in the law, uh, for the most part, if you get to the patent office first with your patent application, you will be awarded the patent versus somebody else who independently came up with the same idea, maybe even before you did, but get, got to the patent office after you, in which case you would get the, the patent first and they would not. Under the old law, whoever invented it first, no matter when you got to the patent office, would get the patent. Uh, we'll take a quick question here from Scott. Given that it takes two plus years for a patent application to be processed, approved, issued, doesn't that make it a significant challenge for people or companies engaged in R&D to recognize when they are either reinventing or infringing on someone else's work? Uh, the short answer to that is absolutely. In fast moving fields, you don't know what the other guys are doing. They don't know what you're doing. And so, the, one of the things to understand is that in the United States, we now have what's called the 18-month publication rule, which is to say, after you file the patent, it will publish, unless you've asked otherwise. Patent application. Right. Uh, patent application. Once you, have a, uh, once you file a patent application, within 18 months, it will publish. So for 18 months, nobody other than yourself and your, your entity, your company, knows what's going on. But also, the other guys don't know what you're doing. You don't know what the other guys are doing. And once it becomes public domain, then it's called super prior art. It pings back and it becomes prior, it can become prior to you. So if you're in a very competitive field, absolutely, this is always the mystery. Do you know what the other guys are doing? Do you know if they're filing? And to be safe, you probably want to file. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in uh, 2000, 99, 2000, the, the height of the tech bubble, you know, all of us who were in telecom were all filing patents like crazy because we didn't know what the other guys were doing and, and we knew everyone was filing and we had to file them. Right now, the hot area is wireless technologies. You know, all these acquisitions, all, all these patents that are being filed, every company's filing wireless patents. You just don't know what the other guys are doing. The first peak you're gonna get at is 18 months. And in fact, because a lot of these companies don't um, publish a lot or go to public meetings, uh, oftentimes people are keeping track of what their competitors are doing by watching what patent application is being published because that's their first clue as to what's going on. You'll see often now blog, blogs coming out saying Apple just published a patent application on a watch that has whatever. Right. Again, people are watching patent applications public. They're not issued patents yet, but they're gleaning from that what is going on within the walls of the company. Right, and that's, and that's what a lot of companies do. They, they watch the publications for their particular industry to see what's being published so they get an idea of where their competitors are going. And so um, that's, that's very important. Um, we have a question um, from Byron. Does the AIA, American Events Act, reduce or eliminate the need to file in other countries? Uh, and the other part of that, it seems like the filing cost in Asian Europe could run 200K plus. Uh, you're, you know, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but it's you're probably not too far from the truth. But uh, no. The, the, 
The AIA is U.S. law, it's for U.S. patents only. You, you have to keep in mind patents are regional. So a U.S. patent only protects your rights within the United States. A European patent can protect your rights in Europe. Um, a Canadian patent protects it in Canada. Um, now, there are some exceptions, like the European patents that can come into uniform. Yeah, the, the European uh, community has had what they've called a European patent for a number of years. Um, but, and which meant that you could file one patent application and get a patent issued that would cover all the European community countries. But to enforce that patent, you'd have to go to each country where you wanted to enforce it and file a separate lawsuit in every country. The change is now that the European Union has agreed, all but Spain and Italy have agreed, that if you have a European patent, you can enforce it for the entire European community by filing in one court. And that court will then enforce the patent all across Europe, sort of like the United States does all across the United States. So that's a, that's a change, and that helps reduce some of the costs if you're filing in Europe, because you don't have to file in every country, and you don't have to have translations for every country. Um, but you're right, there, filing foreign applications can get very expensive, especially if you have to start translating. Fortunately for Europe, English is one of the languages uh, that they accept, so you don't have to translate for Europe. But you do have to translate for Japan, you do have to translate for a lot of countries uh, that are not English speaking, of course. And those translation costs can get expensive, the, the foreign filing fees can get expensive. So it's, you have to make a, an informed decision usually have some time to make that decision. If you file what's called a PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty application, then you're given a period of time to make a decision as to when you want to, where you want to file your PCT application. And so you don't have to decide right away. And if your product is on the market and it's successful, you might decide, yeah, I need to file in a lot of different places. And on the other hand, if you've decided, well, this product is not going anywhere and we're gonna to go to our next generation product, you may decide it's not worth filing. So. so let's quickly get back to our business here for a second. So if you're in a business, um, you've got the inventions, uh, you may choose to do utility patents or generally what are called uh, patents on how something operates. It, um, and if you want to protect the external appearance of it, you may also file design patents. Uh, should you uh, do preliminary patent search? Yes, because there's, if you know something prior art's gonna block you, why you're wasting your money. Right. Uh, think about the patent, you know, if you're gonna get a patent, you'd rather get a worthwhile patent. Um, it's not just simply a badge of courage, it's not free either, and you're gonna pay a lot of money to get that patent, so get something that's gonna be worthwhile and protects your business. Um, the, um, the other thing is by doing the search, you become a more educated person, you know what prior art's out there, you know what has been allowed, you know the, the way the patents are written, that gives you a hint as to how you can write your own patents. Um, keep in mind again, you've got only a one year grace period and that only applies to the United States, so if you're going on sale or you're um, releasing public domain, again remember under the new AIA, for example, if you give a business pitch to venture capitalists, most venture capitalists will not sign NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, so that may in fact be considered a public disclosure and that may set off your one-year grace period. So but you have to be a little more careful now with the new AIA, what sets that off, the courts haven't decided that. And so again, uh, as you understand that you may be setting off that one-year grace period and, and you, know, you may choose to file a provisional application, if not, certainly be cognizant of that one-year bar so that you file appropriately and you aren't barred by some presentation you made to an investor group or something. Um, I think we're out of time. We thank you for your attention, and um, thank you all. Yeah, thanks for being here. Appreciate it.